Hey guys, our first conference, Confessional Piety, is going down in five days. People are flying in from all over the states to be a part of this. People are driving in, carpooling. Uh, it's it's going to be a really good and unique conference. It's going to be beneficial. It's going to be challenging and encouraging, but it's going to be unique, especially because we're bringing in a scholar like Dr. Jim Renahan to teach on confessionalism. Uh, it's unique as well because we're bringing together a group of people that are really a part of this podcast. So we're bringing together a, a family. Uh, we're bringing together friends for a really good time of fellowship as well as learning. So it's not too late. It's five days away, but it's not too late. You can go over to doctrineanddevotion.com slash conference and register today. The first 200 registrants will get free stuff, free books, uh, free journal. Uh, if you're not one of the first 200, you're not going to get that. We could only get that much. So you can come at the door and register right there. Uh, we don't know if we'll have any left. So register, find out what's going on, and we'll see you there. Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne, and all of my notifications are off, and I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, elder candidate at Redeemer Fellowship. What's going on, Fofo? Nothing, nothing. I'm actually really excited uh, to be recording with you tonight, and we're smoking some Liga Pravada number nine. They're tasty. I, uh, I can't believe you splurged. Yeah, like Joe got me. We like don't norm- three great cigars. I don't. I don't normally. <laughs> no, I, I smoke a cigar. Like I, I smoke these uh, uh, AJ Fernandez New Worlds. They're actually very, very mm-hmm. good, and they're one of my favorite cigars. And they're like five dollars, five something. Um, so Ligas are a little, a little more than that. So I want to. I, I want to shout out to Joe. Well, we got. I got special cigars and stuff because the weather's been great. We're recording in my garage, and complete with uh, cigar. Uh, what do you call that? Paraphernalia? Signs and zombie stuff up on the garage yeah, what wall. What is that? Why, why um, do you have that? I'll put this in the show notes. It's a, it's a poster for the Viaje uh, Supershot Z, and it has it looks sort of like um, like what you would shoot at a shooting range. Yeah, yeah obviously yeah. I'm not a gun guy, but you know, especially I'm, with your hand motions I'm, like I'm that, make, I'm making a gun and I'm pointing it and I'm <laughs> shooting it with my hand. You know, at but he's my, got his hand sideways. Oh yeah, because I'm, I'm a gangster. Uh, no, it wasn't Simon. And uh, but it, there's a zombie on it, and his brains are coming out. I'll I'll put it up on the on the show notes. Why do you have that though? Because it's look, it's awesome. No, there's oh, nothing about that. His intestines are hanging out on the side. <laughs> I just don't get. I don't get the whole zombie thing. Oh yeah. I just yeah. don't get it. Like I don't watch The Walking Dead. I'd never watch. Was that World War Z? Yeah. I, I don't watch. You didn't miss anything. Like I, I just don't see. I don't. I don't get. I don't know. I just don't get the you don't, whole thing. You don't get horror. That's the thing. I guess that's it, man. Yeah. I just don't understand it. It doesn't like... All right, well, I used I'll, to watch it when I was a kid. All right. But, I'll, I'll clue you in. I'll clue you in a right. little bit, right? So horror uh, in particular has a number of values that other genres might not share with it uh, that are actually good for people. Um, but when like um, George Romero began exploring the zombie genre, and he essentially invented the the cinematic uh what did he do like give me an idea of what he did uh night of the living dead okay uh, was was the the black and white first big all right never watched that um but then he did uh you know dawn of the dead day of the dead and didn't watch any of those so uh romero uh when he created this 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 zombie mythology um one of the things that it plays to is uh, is a number of uh, social concerns and ideas like for example um when we're looking at these zombies that are essentially animated dead people, mm-hmm. they're no longer human beings that are functional thinking. They're dead, but they're alive, and they're hungry for brains. Um, so they're going to kill you. They're going to eat you. And uh, But what you find in that scenario is that the zombies are not the real danger in the world. The real danger are sinners. The real danger are people. And zombies are relatively easy to kill. Shoot them in the head, cut their head off. They're not very fast. They're pretty slow moving. Mm -hmm. Um, The real danger comes from human beings who It's like those other people that are uh, trying to survive at all costs. Right. So would you say that it's a great genre for an understanding of total depravity? Yes. Yes. And you'll see that in like the remake of Dawn of the Dead. Uh, 
kind of hits that pretty hard, this idea that the, or even um, 28 days later, which is technically it's not a zombie flick, but people think that it is. It's very similar. Uh, the, 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 the people who are maddened, crazy, yeah. animated dead people, they are uh, inflicted with this virus. They are dangerous, but they're not as dangerous as human beings are to one another. I was really shocked that Sandra Bullock was part of that film. She was not. Yes, she was. Nope. She was part of 28 days. No, 28 days later. No, no, 20, yeah, 28 days later. Yeah, 28, 28 days. So wait, 28, 28 days, days? 28 days later. I was that, actually going to go on a rant of making fun of you for watching a Sandra first Bullock First of all, film. the fact that you know that there's a Sandra Bullock movie right, called you know what? 28 I don't, Days. I don't need, I don't need this you to up. judge me. You know who wouldn't watch 28 Days? Who? The Puritans. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should talk about that. I love that transition. So yeah, we're going to be talking about the Puritans tonight. Yeah, we are. All right, so Joe. When we talk about the Puritans, why don't you give us kind of a, a snapshot, maybe give us just an overview of the discussion. Well, let's... Um, Sorry, Joe. Let, let's, let's, <laughs> about I was to about light to light something. my cigar. Um, <laughs> it went out. Uh, well, let, let me first address some misconceptions about them. Because what people kind of know is that, well, there were these, these Puritans and they wore black hats and, and black outfits and we kind of think that they, lo- they looked like Amish people or whatever mm-hmm. and... Um, they were really austere. Um, Define they, austere. They were um, overly serious, not fun. They were lacking joy. Um, oh, Presbyterians of our day. <laughs> <laughs> like Nick Batzig. <laughs> what up, Nick Batzig? Um, yeah, I love so that, that guy. That, that, that you is, need to follow Nick Batzig. If you're not following Nick Batzig, you, he's so much smarter than us. Oh, my gosh. Nick Batzig is brilliant the only complaint that i the only disagreement i have with nick is that he uses those hazers you know those fog <laughs> machines in his worship service yeah nick you know come on dude seriously uh, for that, real dude and that he doesn't tinction does he really no of course not oh, oh my, my gosh. goodness if i let that go he would be so upset because uh that's oh my goodness i was just about no to no like, no he rip. does it right he does it right so um so yeah there are these people that so presbyterians th- yeah they, they people think that that's kind of how they did depict it uh super legalistic mm-hmm. uh very fundamentalistic and all of that um but really these are not fair nor are they accurate descriptions of them at all the Puritans were very well. First of all, they didn't dress in black. Uh, maybe for a for a in black. portrait or something, they would do something yeah. like that. But really, they loved colors. They loved bright colors, and yeah. they painted their houses bright colors when they came to America. They loved colors. They were very pro sex, but they were pro sex in the context of marriage. Mm. And in fact, if a if a husband were to deny his wife sex, uh, he could Wait, get well, in trouble with the state. Maybe they'd be like, uh, uh-uh. uh. I'm just even surprised that that was even that came oh, up. Oh yeah, no, that comes up because they were down with sex. I know, but no, why? How would a husband be like, eh? Uh, this this right here. Well, there is no bueno. Yeah, well, no kidding, and that's why they'd be like, this is serious. Like something's going on. Gotcha. All right. So, but then, what about the other side of that, though? Right? Like, what about those that like turn them into superheroes? Right, and that's where I really fell for for quite a while. I think. Either, oh yeah, you did. <laughs> people either um, you know have this unfair depiction of the Puritans as messed up legalists, or they have this inaccurate uh, perspective of them as if they really didn't have serious flaws. Yeah. And of course they did. Every generation does. Absolutely. And the Puritans were wrong on certain, in certain areas and there were, there were real problems. And so we shouldn't turn any of, I know a lot of people like to talk about their heroes and all of that. And that, that's fine. Um, I don't really use the term, but um, you know, I, I, I really enjoy, we both really enjoy reading the Puritans. We, 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 we love Absolutely. what they how God used them and brought them and what their strengths were. But you have to be able to recognize the problems in your heroes or in the people yes. that you Don't admire. be a fanboy. Don't be a fanboy. You've got to actually go back and listen to that podcast. Um, we, you really need to be able to understand them as human beings who erred, but who also uh, were used by God to accomplish great things. So just, I think we need to have a, a better understanding of who they, what they were really like. And in order to do that, I mean, you, you guess you have to read some history books yeah, of course. Um, and, and pay attention. So, I mean, I mean, when you, then you ask the question like, who were they? Yeah. Well, uh, essentially the Puritans were um, reformed thinking Protestants in England. Yeah. So, it, you know, England, had had this history of going back and forth between you know Roman Catholic leadership and and kings and the and the the official church was Catholic and then it would go Protestantish and kind of go. And that back. Man, we start that started with King Henry, right? Like 
Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Is that, are you talking about Anglicanism, like yeah. the, whole, the whole rise of the Church of England? Right. So that's kind of, that's where it eventually landed, right? It landed. Because some dude wanted to marry some other woman. <laughs> right. So uh, it eventually landed um, with uh, embracing a form of Protestant. Ism. And, um, but, but the issue was there were these people that we tend to call Puritans. There were these people, um, ministers in particular, um, but there were people in England who were a part of the church who had a real issue with certain aspects yeah. of the Church of England. And they felt like there was too many vestiges of Roman Catholicism still a part of of the, of, the church, of the Anglican Church at the time, of the Anglican Church of the of the, the Church of England yeah. uh, at the time. So, and there was you know one particular area right where they were they really dialed in on, and that was on corporate worship. Um, these were people that were so convinced of sola scriptura and so committed to ridding themselves of the oppressive constraints, extra biblical constraints that came from the Roman Catholic Church, that they wanted a more healthy, a more biblical, or a more pure form of worship. Hence Puritans. Right. So they were nicknamed Puritans by their detractors and their opponents. They made fun of them. Oh, you guys are so about the purity. You're, you're like little Puritans, aren't you? So it's supposed to be like a slight. Right. Yeah. Right? Like, it, but they, I would say they probably embraced something like that. Yeah. I don't know if they embraced it or not. Um, the, the name certainly stuck. Yeah. And, and so there, you have this group of, of Protestants, these committed Bible believing yeah. Christians in the Church of England who disagreed with the Church of England and they they sought to 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 do uh church life and the Christian life in a particular way and they went about it in two different ways. So you have you have these it, ultimately you wind up with these Puritans who um were trying to stick it out with the Church of England and mm -hmm. see reform brought about. And then you have these others who were separatists, right? They, they, they like, we're, we've given up. It's so they not split into work. two groups. Yeah, basically so it's like, two groups. So they're like the Baptists of the day. They already split. And, and as a matter of fact, this is where Baptists came from. What? Ba Baptists yeah. came out of That the joke separatists. not only landed, but it was historical. <laughs> it was true. <laughs> it was true. So, yeah, uh, Baptists ultimately um, emerge in yeah. the 17th century uh, among so yeah, we, the, we've the been for how many how many years now? Uh, since the 1600s, you do the math. Um, now, what happened was is um, a, a, with there was this um, act of conformity that was passed in England, where you basically, if you weren't um, doing it the uh, the Church of England way, you were out. And so they, a number of ministers were ejected in 1662, I believe, and. Um, and among them are guys like uh, Thomas Watson. Oh, okay. Right. So a lot of ministers were eject ejected, and a number of them came to America. And with them, a lot of their uh, congregations or the people that followed them uh, came to America as well. And so, so uh, seeking, I guess, religious freedom. If you want, can I use that? Yeah, like yeah, totally. They they were they were seeking religious freedom, but even more than that, they were they were not just running from something; they were running to something. Like the Puritans wanted to establish uh, this the city on a hill. They wanted to establish, like what would it look like if we could establish a, um, not just a church that was pure, but a society that was governed by scripture. And so really coming from their, their day, their time, they really saw that the church and state interrelated. Mm. And so that, that's what they wanted to build in coming to America. Like a theocracy? Yeah, they, it was. It was. Very I know we're going to talk about that later. We've yeah, been, we've been. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Toying I don't, with that. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right word for it, to be honest. But yes, they they really saw um, the church and the state having this this intertwined relationship. So that's this is why, um, if a woman, for example, in uh, when the when the Puritans came to America, if if a woman had a miscarriage, the husband could get in trouble. If it was if she had the miscarriage because she was riding the horse and doing work instead of resting, because it would be the husband's responsibility to make sure that she's resting, so like he could get into legal troubles. He you could be put in the stocks for doing the wrong thing uh, in your house, like with your wife. So there was this, you know, it was a, there was a, this intertwining of of the two spheres, which Baptists completely rejected that notion. Um, and it was they easy. wanted the separation of church and state. Yeah, and uh, it was easy for them to want that because the the Christian, uh, you know. Uh, civil run uh, colonies kept kicking them out and making them die in the winter. Anyways, um, what, what then happens is in 1689, the act of toleration is passed in England 
which allows dissenting ministers to practice their faith differently from the Church of England. And so this this is why in 1689, uh, we have the Second London Confession. Yeah, well, get, like, that, that's an important date, right? We call it the 1689 Baptist Confession or the 1689 Second London Confession. And it's the Second London because the First London Confession was written in 1644, and in 1677, they copied and, and altered the Westminster Confession and the Sadler made Declaration. It better. They, I think they improved it. And then, uh, but they couldn't really publish it and put their name on it because of persecution. So in 1689, when the Act of Toleration was passed, uh, these Baptist Puritans, essentially, um, were able to articulate their faith and, and come out uh, strong. So the, the, the Puritans were a, a group of Christians who were organized around this principle of sola scriptura yeah. and the desire for a church that is pure from from worldly and pagan and extra biblical um, influences, and they had you know theology that was very Calvinistic, yeah. very reformed. But would you say they also were about toleration? Well, like, how would you like? I guess I'm talking about religious freedom. Is kind of what I'm really getting to. Yeah, the Baptists were the ones that were really about that kind of a freedom. The, um, like I said, the, the Puritans left uh, in large. Not just some of them left because they wanted to go to America and establish something new. Yeah, uh, many were ejected and they had nowhere to go. But um, they, I don't know that the Puritans were known for toleration. Mm. I know that Baptists were known for saying, "Hey, Baptists were the first guys to be saying things like, hey, um, you should be able to live here and believe you can be Jewish, atheistic, Muslim, Christian. There should be no punishment for that. So Free, Baptists where have guy. we gone wrong as a Oh, the Baptist convention. Of oh, they, they gave that up a long time ago. Yeah, they, Baptists, Baptists want today. It seems like most Baptists want freedom for themselves, but uh, religious freedom for themselves, but, but not for those dirty Muslims. They don't like them. So they got We got to we got to shut that down. Whereas, you know, guys like Dr. Russell Moore understand that if we don't seek as Americans, if we don't seek to protect religious liberty for all, then we are in jeopardy of losing our religious freedom yeah. as Christians. So anyways, um, that's, who the, that's who the Puritans were. And, you know, the Puritans have become much more widely read than they were 100 years ago yeah. because of Banner of Truth in particular. Absolutely. So like, but why should people be reading that, right? Like why... Why should we care what they have written? Why should we care what they have, I guess, processed and, and put forth? Well, I think it's a good idea to read all kinds of Christians, as long as they're articulating the gospel and the truth. Yeah, and but I, I mean, think, I think in this case, we're talking about Puritans. Okay, I'm getting to that. Okay, I'm just I'm saying, I, into I feel it. like you're ducking the question. Well, I, do I ever duck a I don't well, I, I feel like you're circling around no, 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 think no, about it. I just want it. you to get to the point. Yeah. Why should we read well, One of the, the reasons is yeah, because it's important for people to be broadly read, and we should be reading everybody from Wesley to uh, Whitfield. And so that's good for you. So number one, it's good to be broadly read and to okay. read um, all kinds of Christians. I read liberal Christians. I read all kinds of guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Pur Purdick? The, well, no. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, just I, I'm not saying liberal. I'm just saying Furtick. I mean, I'm just yeah, asking your no. question. I'm just I asking read, a question. I, I read smart guys. Anyways, um, the, the Puritans in particular are good to read because they dial in, they zero in very well on the soul yeah. and the human experience. The, 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 the Puritans were very yeah. concerned with the state of men's souls, the, the condition of women's souls. And they were very concerned about not just individual salvation, um, but they were also concerned about sanctification, about holiness, about communion with God. And contrary to what some people have said today, they were very concerned about the Christian community. Yes. Their whole thing was about the corporate church and about developing a, a church that was um, centered around the word and robust in its liturgy. And I'm using that word very broadly here. Um, and they were very big on good works, and they, they really valued what we would call small groups, but they really valued holy conference or mm. coming together to encourage and exhort one another in the Word. So the, the Puritans are good to read. One of the reasons people should read the Puritans is because they, they are able to interact with the, the, the individual person's experience yes. and need for the grace of God, for good theology as it connects to... Um, our experience of God and our faith. And, and that I would say that's the second reason 
or the third reason technically here, the third reason people should read the Puritans is because they were the best since the apostles at connecting doctrine uh, to our experience. For them, theology was meant to be not just known yes. intellectually, but experienced um, to uh, to be known in the heart. It should give birth to piety, to That's godliness, right. to love and to faith and to good works. Which is contrary to like what we see today. We see a right. lot of people that are, uh, they might have the right doctrine or they might think of themselves as, like they, they read the Puritans, they, they look to the Puritans, but they miss the point of what they're writing and with a purpose of what, of why they are writing yeah. is that theology or doctrine is not just an intellectual exercise, but it should lead to devotion. It should be leading to this heart change and this love for God and neighbor. This is why we call our podcast doctrine and Absolutely. devotion because the two oh, must you're gonna, oh, be, you're going to let people in on the secret. That, that's the secret. they they are necessarily linked. You can't have devotion without doctrine. And if your doctrine doesn't lead to devotion, you're doing it wrong. And that's why, like, Joe is the doctrine of the podcast, and, and I'm the devotion. Like, right. So I'm out the of smart the two, one, Jim is the dumb one. No, no, you're the smart one. I'm Calvin, you're I verdict. just love God more. With, in your ignorance, yes. But he accepts it. Through Christ. Through Christ. Because it's so pathetic it, otherwise. It, thank, praise be to God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I, 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 the, one of the real problems here, here's what's, here's what's interesting about the Puritans. A lot of guys that get into the Puritans, they start talking like Puritans did. Um, they start, Oh father, oh, how holy art thou? All right. So, uh, the Puritans would, um, would smack you upside your head with their big hat because their whole thing was speaking and preaching plainly. Yes. Plainly, not meaning boring, but meaning clear using the language of the day. That's right. When you start trying to talk today, like Puritans talked back then, you are, you are doing it wrong. The Puritans say you're yeah. doing it wrong. You've got to, you got to commute. This is why Spurgeon got into so much trouble because he talked like everybody else when he, they were like, Whoa, he's so uncouth. He's, he, he's so worldly in the way mm -hmm. that he talks because he knew like the Puritans, you've got to communicate to people in the language that they use of the day. That's right. So I, I it's, it's funny to me and it's sad how, and, and one of the problems that you and I have in the reformed community is that we sometimes so focus on being right and being accurate and technical in our theology that we somehow along the way completely miss that it, that has to be applied to um, individual experience and corporate experience of the people of God so that they Absolutely. are being led, challenged, directed, rebuked, humbled, uh, exalted by the grace of God and all of that. If you're not, if you're not, um, affected by these doctrines, if you aren't preaching with an aim of people's hearts being changed, not just their intellects and their brains swelling, then um, you are definitely out of step with the Puritans. And I think that's why you wrote your three books on the church, right? Uh, your three books put out by Moody Publishers and for the church, the heart of the church, uh. the character of the church, and the life of the church. You can head on over to DoctrineDevotion.com slash three books, and you can pre-order today. I hate it when you hawk my books. Now, it's funny. The publisher loves it when you do that. I just... <laughs> Everybody knows my books are out there. You don't have to. You don't have to. No, I, them because I think it's actually useful. It's great stuff right, so for membership out, orientation, right. for leadership development, mm, and for yeah. elder teams. I here's think the, it's a great Joe. Here's what seriously, I've always no, 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 seriously, Joe. Yeah, seriously, seriously, honestly. Okay, for sure. Okay, Real. these are great books. Mm -hmm. I mean, you probably could have written it all in one volume. Well, yeah, it's. it's I know, but it's you wanted to have a trilogy of three books. That's yeah, great. So it's like awesome. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. You know? Yeah, yeah, but and Joe Thorne's Life of the Church, and Back to the Future. Back, there was only three. Yeah. yeah, for some reason I had in my head there was a fourth one. Yeah, well maybe there was. No, there wasn't. Maybe alternate universe. Oh, theories. Um, yeah. All right, let's move on. Everybody knows about that. Um, Go grab DoctrineDevotion dot com okay. slash three books. All right, so Jimmy, uh, you know we're talking about why people should read the Puritans. Anything else you want to add? Like you know you read the Puritans. Um, now, I, I love the honesty. Like, I love the honesty in there. Because I, I, um, I sway towards... Uh, Fertikian theology? <laughs> <laughs> I sway towards those books that, like, try to tell me what to do and what to believe. And I, what I love about the Puritans is there is that, that intellectual. There is that, like, there is that, like, this is what doctrine is. But I love the honesty in it of my struggle, and it points me to the gospel. It points me to my need of a savior. Uh, so what I love about it is that, that there's an honesty, there's a rawness, there's a realism to it that 
and maybe maybe the right word is vulnerability. There's a vulnerability sure. there um, as they're kind of they've sorted through these things. Are they sorting through? I don't know if they. I don't think anyone's ever really arrived. Right. Um, and then you're kind of participating in that because you're sorting through them yourself. Right. And so I, there's a connection there. There's there's a way of of empathizing. There's a way of like mm-hmm. understanding what the struggles are, mm-hmm. and you're finding that solution together. So I, I don't know. For me, there's a connection there of vulnerability. There's a connection of honesty. There's a connection of raw that the Christian faith is not all cut and dry, right? Like it's not as easy as I think people try to make it out to be. Right. And we don't have all the answers. And so how do you sort through all these things together? You know, these are guys that thought deeply and long about these doctrines and they had to work them out. Uh, a lot of them had to work them out in a day, an age, in a circumstance where um, infant mortality rates were exceedingly high, where the life expectancy was very low. We're talking about you know colonial America yeah. basically here. Uh, it's it was um, it was a rough time, and so these are people that knew what suffering was. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, these people also knew what like what conversion was. Yeah. Like I think what sanctification was because even think of like the whole idea of private conference, mm-hmm. right? Like where the minister actually invested in the life. Mm-hmm. of the convert right it wasn't just come down the aisle profess faith and hey i'll see you on sunday and give your give your offering yeah it was we're gonna meet i want to know that you you understand this truth that you that you've embraced the gospel that you are uh that you're making that public profession of faith that as parents you are shepherding and leading your children in the faith like there was much more to this it wasn't just it wasn't just this intellectual exercise, but it was, this is something that is radically going to change your life. Right. Right. And I think, you know, the fact that that was an emphasis demonstrates what they were facing, you know, yeah. in their day, like the Puritans were trying to correct course. No, there's a, I know since we're talking about horror movies, um, there's a, there's a uh, horror movie. No, you'll like this. There's oh, a horror I'm, movie I'm out not going to like it. You will. There's a horror movie out there. Uh, and most of you, probably shouldn't see it um i won't but um but there's a horror movie out there called the witch and now the witch first of all you went and saw this with somebody else and not me yeah because you wouldn't see it and i got to see it and I, we got to talk to the director was there a big interview q i would have hated it yeah i oh, know that's why i didn't read so anyways listen here's the thing um it the, the movie revolves around um uh like a puritan colony and uh there is a man in his family and there is some kind of religious debate between this man and the the church and they're telling him you're preaching another gospel and he's like you're preaching another gospel and and they said listen if you don't repent and recant you're gonna have to get out of here and he says all right then i'll go so they leave and they go out into the wilderness on their own this family now uh, a lot of bad things happen there's witchcraft satan's there it's a it's a dark dark movie it's a dark 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 movie with a dark 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 ending so don't go and see it and i don't want to hear anybody crying about how they went and saw it and they think i'm pagan because i watched i'm telling you don't go see it and you are pagan and so um but here's what you see is this family's in the woods they're struggling their family is falling apart and the they're 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 reciting uh puritan catechesis they're in fact i think it's cotton mather's um catechism that the boy is reciting and the father's quizzing him but nobody in this family has assurance of salvation they're all desperately afraid that they're going to go to hell it's like they are calvinists but they are uh, unhealthy calvinists they they these this family is has embraced some wrong gospel in the midst of this. And it's like they have so many doctrines correct, but there is no joy, there is no hope, and ultimately um, things go really bad for them. So the fact that the Puritans were pushing so hard in this is important for us, and it's important for us because we do tend to miss it as well. One of the things that I like about reading the Puritans is that they always break things down into little pieces. I like little pieces. Um, like, yeah, because I'm a little guy, I know like little... I know, where I know where you're going. Uh-huh. What? Yeah. Joe. Lunchables. I know. I get Joe. it. Okay. Joe, I what like would you think? I, yeah, no, I, I was, I was actually thinking you can tell the influence of the Puritans on your writing. Because I write small booklets. <laughs> yeah, see. All right. So, um, so like when, when they, uh, they'll give like a sermon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so in their sermons, they'll break it down. And at the end, they'll have like 15 uses for this doctrine. 
Like, like several uses or, or, or you know, 10 uh, observations on this doctrine that will relate to our lives. I love that. Or they'll break down um, their treatise into so many little sections and yeah. subheadings that you can work through them and not feel like you're getting overwhelmed because you just deal with one subsection at a time. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that reading the Puritans can be easier than most people think because, listen, start with a sermon. Start with a, yeah. start with a small book or a treatise. Well, and I think that's why I like reading the Puritans, though, is because— it, you can look at it almost devotionally. You could take that one yeah. section and stay there. Yeah. You could, and, and, and like, there's so much in that one section that to just read it and blow past it, you're, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know, I love, like, and one of the things, like, for me is I, I like reading it devotionally, you know, sermons or these little snippets and just for, just take that paragraph with me for the day. Mm hmm. And just really kind of chew on it, think about it. Uh, and that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I like reading the Puritans because it doesn't like, it's not giving you a buckshot. It's giving you a, just the sniper, sniper shot, shot yeah. of this doctrine. Right. Well, let, let's talk about some of the, some particular works that we like. Like what are some of our favorite Puritans? One of the works? ones I've been going through myself personally has been uh, my man Flavel Flav. Mm -hmm. And reading through his sermons in volume one. Yeah, we got the, we got his collected works. We got his collected works. And just like, and, and it's one of the things like I'm looking forward to with Joe is kind of discussing those things. And hopefully others, I'm thinking of Pat and stuff like that, kind of working through those together. Because there's so much there yeah. that I just want to like talk about and chew over and digest. And I, I, want, I want to bounce things off other people. Um, and so I really love like, you know, uh, his sermons, I have loved the works of John Owen, mm -hmm. especially on the Holy spirit, his work on communion with God wrecked me. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to even go through my head, like the reformed pastor. I pastor. mean, that ruined my understanding of the pastor at like, here was a dude that was vi doing these visitations. How many visits was he doing a day? Like 70? Oh, yeah. It yeah, the, I mean, we were talking about how pastors were investing in people, and I'm like, yeah, that's Baxter, man. And we're like, and you know, I, I don't know. So, anyways, just reading through and just like digesting or trying to chew over this one snippet, right. I think is really healthy. Yeah, one of the f the first Puritan book I read was Samuel Bolton's The True Bounds of Christian Freedom. And it was interesting because I read it at Moody Bible Institute when we were studying the whole lordship salvation controversy. And, uh, and but so here I am reading a treatise on law and gospel and the uses of the law. And it was it was better than anything else I was reading at the time. Um, some of my favorite Puritan works. Uh, I love Thomas Watson. And so um, Thomas Watson on uh, his body of divinity, Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer was really good for me. Um, John Bunyan on prayer is a Puritan paperback that everyone should get and read. Uh, fantastic. A lot of people love Richard Sibbs, The Bruised Reed, which is great, but I really liked even more William Bridge, An Uplifting for the Downcast. Uh, so oh, for, yeah. So for those who are struggling with uh, you know, depression, anxiety, things like that, um, that can be a really helpful work for you. It definitely um, has been um, really, really good for me. So those are, those are a few. Um, and yeah, I'm with... I'm with um, Jimmy here, uh, Owen is great. You know, if you're reading Owen and if you're not reading the updated language, it, you know, it can be a, Owen can be a bear to get through. Yeah. And Which even, is why I like the Smith, like going like smaller chunks. Yeah. Puritan paperbacks. Some of those are updated language. So you might want to start with some of those, but here's the thing with the Puritan, whether you're reading, like, start with a sermon. Oh, that's what I tell people. Start with a sermon, find and you can find them online and start reading it. Now here's the thing. Um, there are going to be references there that you do not get. Yeah. They're going to they're going to reference maybe art or there are usually like some poet and you like, have no or some historical thing and you're like I have no idea what we're talking about. That's fine. You're not going to get lost in yeah. the sermon though. So keep going, understand what you can, look up words that you don't know the, the definition to and look for the main point, look for the points of application. Um and it, pick up sibs, start in volume 1, start reading the sermons and uh you finish that sermon I, I don't I don't want to say I guarantee, but I guarantee you're going to be rewarded uh, for the Absolutely. investment. So, so good. All right, man. We talked about the Puritans. So why don't you tell people if they want to follow us on social media, where do they go? Uh, they can you can follow us on Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Instagram at Doc and Devo. They can go to Facebook and look us up. Mm. Facebook.com slash 
doctrine and devotion. You can follow us. Uh, let's see. Do we have a Reddit page? No. No. Do we have like? Are we supposed to be doing a Reddit thing? The, the young people do that. I don't know how. To I do know what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to be doing so? We're I, supposed to do an AMA. Yeah, ask me anything on Reddit. We should probably. We were invited like, to do that. I know, but I was in Florida. Yeah, and then you were somewhere else. Then you were Philly. Philly. Yeah. Um. So we'll get on that. So let's see where else. Uh, uh, you can website. Uh, Website, DoctrineDevotion.com. You can click on the Contact Us page, fill out the form, give us your thoughts, ideas, your suggestions. You can click on the Sign Up page where you can uh, subscribe to our email list. We're going to be having content there just for our email subscribers. You can leave us an honest five-star review on iTunes or your podcast provider. Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday. Blog posts every Wednesday. Later. Pretty soon. Oh, no. Pretty don't, soon don't stop. What's pretty soon? Video content Fridays only for our email subscribers. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think I need to hit the gym first. Wait, what? I think I need to hit the gym before we do video content. I think I need to get a makeover. Uh, I, I'm not in disagreement, but we're doing the video content. Yeah, I know. I just think we need to wait until I, you know, clean we're not waiting. Up. We're clean not. My, I got to clean myself up. A we are bit. not waiting. I'll this, be on video. We, I need to look. This good. is going to start coming out soon. Yeah, we need to get on this. We, this is we, on us. We, we'll get on it, but it just can we know, tell people what we're going to do? Give me like six months. Can we? T- should we tell people or no? No. Just video content. It's going to be good, devotional, and you're going to be able to participate. Later. Later.